Hi everyone, welcome to the IATL and welcome to Applied Information's next webinar series. We're doing a totally different one today, which is all on other kinds of products that we normally don't talk about with everybody, but it's one of those things that we're doing. So today I'm Peter Ashley and we've got uh, Drew Dooley, who's our expert on all our other products. So I'm really going to be delving into his knowledge. And uh, before we begin, we're going to hand it over to Jessica, who's going to uh, just explain some of the things that we've got to do today. Hey, y'all. Uh, and um, we're coming live from my kitchen again. Um, as you can see, we've created kind of an intro and stuff like that. Um, but our Q&A will work as usual. Use your tool um, at the bottom of your control labeled Q&A. And we're going to uh, address questions kind of as we go along today. Um, if you need anything else, feel free to enter into the chat box. Um, if your stream stops working for any reason or you need to hop off early, this is going to be recorded and we will also uh, be sending a follow-up email with the week. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Jessica. So just to give everyone a bit of a background of, of how I'm going to do this today, um, I've got a couple of slides that I'm going to use to just talk through um, some of the different products that we've got and, and Drews and I are going to talk about that. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take a walk around from what's behind us and go show you some of the cool stuff in action and how it all looks. And depending if we have time available, I might jump into a little bit of live glance demo. Um, but we'll see how it goes. So if you give me a second, I'm going to go turn on uh, the, um, the presentation. What you guys are going to see is um, just a couple of slides that we use. So, you know, applied information. Some of you guys don't know us. Uh, we deployed in about 580 cities with about 18,000 devices deployed. And we're about 75 employees. Um, our core product lines. Now, this is something that I'm not going to talk about today, but just so that everybody understands. We do connected school zones and connected pedestrian crossings. And then the second big line of ours is connected traffic signal controllers. So that's basically us providing um, you know, cellular connectivity to your traffic signal controllers. Then at the same time, those same units actually do emergency vehicle preemption. Um, so we can give emergency vehicles green lights while they're going through traffic signals. And one of the really exciting things that we do is we also do uh, connected vehicle technology. So this connected vehicle technology is, um, you know, we're able to broadcast messages to people in their vehicles when they're going to run a red light. Um, and it's, you know, a free smartphone application, but we also actually have all the connected vehicle technology like um, DSRC and CV2X radios. And we've been doing a lot of sessions on that. Today's focus is going to be on our other product lines. So the first one that I wanted to talk about was railroad crossings. So you're going to see over here, um, we've got a, a, a railroad that's in the middle over here where you see that intersection over here. And there's a bunch of devices uh, all around it. And this is in a city in the Boston area. Drew, what is the name of the city? Uh, the city is Agawam. Agawam. OK, and how, can you just explain how this system actually works? Sure. Uh, as you can see on the map, what we have is a, uh, one of our intersection units. And then surrounding it, we have several of the yellow signs, which are our uh, railroad preamp uh, beacons. So what happens is, is the intersection gets a basically a preempt signal from the railroad system saying, hey, there, there's a train. Uh, and then because of, you can see the, the densely populated and the, the maze of roads and what have you, 
they actually have signs that warn you that the intersection is going to be closed or unpassable because there is a train on the tracks. Uh, sometimes because you know there's only one set of tracks and there's many trains a train might have to sit for a while and what they're doing is is they're alleviating all the problems with people trying to just sit in traffic uh, to know that there's a train blocking the, the tracks so our preemption our intersection unit gets the preempt and then it sends a signal to uh, all the yellow signs which activate just like a school beacon that there's a train on the tracks find a different route and this was because what happened at something like that was we had the problem there that they have freight trains going through and they block that intersection for sometimes up to 45 minutes. Yes. So this is something that basically solves a real world problem. Now, uh, you were talking about reading it as a preempt, just not everybody understands that. So in other words, that's when the barrier gate comes down. Correct. Okay. Uh, what happens if you don't have a barrier gate at one of those uh, intersections? Uh, there's different ways to wire it in our, our intersection unit so that we still get triggered that the lights are flashing or the uh, crossing is active in some way or fashion. Okay, and, and can, can they detect the train using other kinds of technologies? Uh, yeah, I mean, as we've seen with uh, the iTerrace and other intersections, they can use cameras. Uh, you could also use a radar or something else to determine that they, the big heavy train is in the way that, and it's not normally there. Okay, so we're gonna go and have a look at, we've got that up on the back wall. So we'll go look at that in a little bit more detail um, in a second. Um, so this is actually quite interesting, which is our um, railroad um, crossing. Are you guys seeing this? Mm, it's not changing on my screen, sorry guys. I'm having a technology snafu over here. Let me just reshare my screen. Um, there we go. You guys should see that again. All right. So the railroad crossings, um, this is quite interesting. So this is the actual data coming back from that intersection where you can actually see over here that on the 2nd of May, they had 15 events. The longest duration event was 47 minutes. The average frequency of the trains coming through was 36 minutes. And the average duration of, a, of an event was six minutes long. But the important one to look at is that maximum duration. I mean, they've got a lot of long events, 51 minutes, 50 minutes. So they've got a lot of these very, very long events that happen. And this is a way of them actually tracking what's been happening along those, um, along those uh, uh, intersections. So the, the next product that I wanted to talk about, and we're going to go into more details of all these products as we walk around, is flood warning. We've seen a big pickup in this. And um, this is actually at a location in Washington County, Oregon, where they um, had a roadway that would flood very regularly. And I can see all this water mass over here that's sort of around it. Drew, I think you actually went up there for this installation. Can you explain what their situation was there? Yeah, sure. Um, what they have is actually a road that's going right by a wetlands area. Um, and it was very common that the road would flood and people would just go ahead and drive the road anyway, get stuck, get the engine flooded and, and have problems and, and cause a whole mess. Not to mention it's a wetlands, so you kind of want to protect it from the, the nature standpoint. Uh, so what they've done is we've embedded basically a pipe into the uh, surrounding ground by the road and they're using an acoustic sensor to determine how much the water from the water table and all that has, has risen or dropped. Uh, and then depending on that, we're sending them an alarm and they, and they physically go out and they move the gates to block the road. And then we also have through a glance, they're able to activate the, the flashers on the sign or on the gates. So people can of course see the gates closed and, and not drive through there. So uh, tell me about the alerts. I believe there's two different alert levels, right? Yes, uh, we've basically got kind of a, a first level and then a second level at which we can customize and set depending on, uh, of course, the flooding stages or the emergency. I think we've got it set to maybe 50%. And then 75%, they know they definitely need to go take action. 
Okay, and, and, and this was in Washington, Oregon, where you had the ultrasonic sensor detecting the water level. Um, now, you've also done some deployments in Texas where we're using a, a sensor that hangs over the roadway. Correct. Um, you know, that was a specific application. Uh, a more generic application for most people would be, uh, as Peter was saying, is we have a pole mounted on the side of the road, and then we have a, the ultrasonic sensor or a radar sensor, different types, uh, sensing uh, basically a rise from the surface of the road. Okay. Okay. That's pretty cool. Um, then, you know, as, as you're looking into the flood warning, when you click on a device, you'll actually see more information about a device. You know, you'll see all the information in terms of the water level. Uh, you'll see graphs of the water level. And you'll even see pictures uh, of, of what's actually happening around those intersections. Um, so what's really cool is actually that picture tells a lot of information. You, you know, when, we've, when there was a flooding event, we actually saw the flood, you know, you can see the water over there, but that whole area all along here was totally flooded. And you can see over here that there's actually barrier gates that they close. And on these gates, there's little flashing beacons and those flashing beacons activate. So they can then verify, okay, the local person went over there and closed the gates and turned the flashes on because they can see it straight through this webcam. Um, so it's a pretty, pretty cool thing. Now, Drews, what am I looking at here in this picture? Uh, what you're looking at actually is the town of New Braunfels, Texas. Uh, they, I guess this was another one that you were involved is, in. This is another one of the, uh, yeah, off the wall ones that I do here. Um, so they've got, uh, obviously we know Texas is for the majority part very flat, but they have a, a train truss. And then they have the road going under that. Well, you can only dig down so deep um, before you're creating a lake or any kind of body of water. So they have a, a height restriction. And as you can see in the sign, it's what, 11.6 or? 11.8. 11.8. Um, so what we were helping them do is, is we actually have uh, lasers that shoot across the road that detect anything that is 11 feet, 8 inches high. And then it'll turn on these flashers to let people know you're too high, you don't need to go, you're going to hit the bridge. Okay, so this is inside of their little cabinet. Um, and I see, obviously, there's a, there's a black box solution over here uh, on a base plate with a power supply over there and a circuit breaker. What is this black box? Uh, the black box is the, the AI FMU. Uh, it's just field monitoring unit. Uh, basically, it is, I, I like to refer to it as our Swiss Army knife. It has lots of I.O. to it. Uh, of course, it's cellular like all our other devices. It's, it's very similar to everything, but it just has a lot of I.O. that we can use for different things, for sensing, uh, for activating relays, which is over there by the circuit breaker, for instance, uh, to turn flashers on or send other notifications. Okay, and then let's have a look at these laser sensors where we've got some of them in the back that we're going to look at a little bit later but this is this laser sensor over here that's on the actual traffic signal pole uh, how does this thing <clears throat> detect does it like detect a break in the laser what is it how does it how does it actually work um, it's actually quite sophisticated of course it's laser and it's high tech to begin with uh, but what we're able to do is, is actually set um, the gap that it's actually looking at, because of course the laser is, is shooting across the road with, until it hits something and stops. But we're actually saying, of course, you know, if you're within five feet, ignore it, and then if you're within that next 10 feet, pay attention, and then anything after that, ignore it. Uh, case in point, the intersection we looked at, that is this picture where the, the camera or the laser is right there by the pole and is on the side of traffic. If you look at the last picture, we're actually looking for the traffic coming inbound, which is in the opposite lane. So this is a perfect example of where we set the laser to look up, look at a beam being broken past 15 feet to 25 feet to catch so traffic can, coming in the other lane huh. and ignoring all the close traffic, which is going outbound away from the bridge. So you can select any lane with this, and then you don't need 
a separate pole? Because I've seen these on the side of the highways, you know, the, the old school style from Trig or whatever their name is, where they've got one device sending information, then they've got a reflecting pole on the other side of the road that they've got to install. You don't need any pole on the other side of the road to reflect. No, not in this one. And you can detect basically a per lane as well. Yes. So for instance, we could also do something clever like just detect the turn lane, which might be turning into where there's a, a, a covered bridge example, like a Marietta or something that, that gets hit often, uh, and ignore the straight lane because they're not going to be going anywhere. Hmm. Okay. That's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> I found something that I'm going to stump you on now. Radio tower monitoring. Were you, were you, were you involved with the install of that one? No, there was a guy I think called Peter that might have done that one. <laughs> that was one of this was about five years ago, um, and it, it, can you guys see my radio tower? I think it's lost it again. Um, apologize for this technical snafu here, guys. Um, for some reason, it doesn't like me. I think writing on the screen here. Yeah, too much writing. So here we are again. Um, so this little unit over here is um, a radio tower that was actually in the middle of Arkansas where what happened was they ran through $10,000 of propane when the power got cut. So it's, it's, a, it's running all the emergency services radios and um, they just didn't know about it until the radio stopped working. And it turns out the power was just never restored there. So what we do is we actually monitor the actual power coming into it and we send out an alarm and if the generator kicks in we also send out another alarm so every wednesday the generator kicks in so they can see that it's working but that way they never ever ran out of uh propane again and they didn't waste ten thousand dollars by in by installing a small little device that monitored everything well not to mention get that much propane up into the mountain so interestingly enough, just to get there, it uh, took us about uh, an hour and a half to get there. We had to have a special off-road vehicle with specialized tires to get up to the top of the mountain because it was, well, first of all, it was a bit wet. It was a lot of fun getting there as well, as you can imagine. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, it, there's always some fun things that happen in these things. But yeah, I, I didn't want to go back up there. So we made sure the installation was really good. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about is curve warning systems. This is another project that we've done in Washington County in Oregon. Um, Drews, can you tell me about what I'm, you know, if I say curve warning to you, how did this thing actually work? Um, as we're all familiar mostly with curve warnings is, you know, the more of a static sign and maybe some flashing beacons to warn you that the, the curve in the road is, is tight and you need to slow down. Uh, in this instance, we're actually using uh, weather telemetry to figure out, should we lower the, the road speed to, and warn you about what's going on? So this one actually takes um, two of our devices again. It takes the, the FMU and a school beacon. Uh, the FMU is hooked up to a, I guess, Luft, I don't remember their new name now, uh, but people are gonna still be O-T -T using. OTT Luft. OTT Luft. Um, <clears throat> Starwis unit to determine the conditions on the road. Is it wet? Is it icy? You know, dampness and all that kind of factors to give you your traction. Uh, and then based on that, it's lowering the speeds on the beacon that's connected to a radar sign to give you feedback to let you know you should be driving a little slower because it is slippery around that, a tight corner. In fact, uh, the guys from Washington County said it, it, they actually had to close a lane of traffic to install this because it's so blind and tight of a corner that it was dangerous not to just be on the side of the road doing it. They actually close a lane to, it, to do these installs. So they're using one of those driver feedback signs if anyone can see in the background behind us. Yeah. There's a driver feedback sign there and that's what they actually lowering the speed and flashing and warning people that it's more dangerous now. Right. It's a pretty interesting use of technology, especially a, very much a life-saving technology in Washington County where they have inclement weather and very cold conditions that happen. Yes. Um, this is the, is the other part of it, which is the road weather information system. So here we, we're able to monitor air temperature, precipitation, and, and, and so on, as well as the roadway conditions. 
There are various different sensors that we use um, to monitor these things in different situations. You always use different types of sensors. But it's going to give you information like the road temperature, air temperature, water film thickness, freezing, um, and so on. Um, I'm, I'm going to, I've got a little note over there that we've got some questions that Jessica wants to ask us. Jessica, why don't you go ahead and, uh, and, and ask us those couple of questions? Yeah, I just have one, one for now, um, but someone is asking, what's the frequency for the maintenance and the procedure for the laser beam to make sure that the system is running um, okay? So I guess they want to know how often they need to um, look at it and to maintain. believe we've actually had any maintenance calls on that unit uh, no and in fact uh, our distributor for one of for, well, in the Texas area kind of they'd even forgot about it because it was just working um, in the Texas one they actually have a good scenario where the garbage trucks have to drive by one of them and of course they're not driving under the bridge but they're driving past one of them you know on their weekly runs to pick up garbage uh, so that's always giving them uh, the credibility that it's that's working, they can go look at the graphs quick. Uh, we also have, since it is through the glance system, we can set up the email alerts and all that. Um, but that one's just been taken away. We also have another one in Seattle, which is actually in a park that people use as kind of a cut through for traffic. And if you look at the map, you can see, oh yeah, naturally everybody's spilling off the main arterial onto here. Uh, and it has lots of hits Monday through Friday because of traffic. And then on Saturday and Sunday, you can see all, the, all of it goes down. Um, but, you know, from a maintenance standpoint, it would be your normal stuff, probably going out and cleaning the lens maybe on a yearly basis. Uh, but looking at your reports in glance, you can see at a, at a quick view if anything's uh, And you an get anomaly. a text message if yeah. something fails. Yeah, yeah. And we, we've got sensor faults that we also put out. So if we don't get anything from the sensor for so long, we can kind of say, hey, you need to go check. But uh, yeah, I don't think anyone's actually done any maintenance and they've just kind of Yeah, and away. what's quite nice is actually the sensor's got a, like a shield over the top of it that keeps it nice and clean and so on. So there's, there's definitely, and I, I know you, you, should be, you should be cleaning it. I don't think everybody actually goes out and cleans it all the time, but you should be going out probably once a year to go clean those yeah. things. Um, Arwis, you know, road weather information systems, you know, what you're looking at is you're looking at um, air temperature, precipitation, precipitation type, um, and then, uh, you know, on the, on the ground, you would be looking at the uh, water film thickness, ice thickness, snow height, your friction level of the roadway, um, the ice percentage and saline, um, concentration in terms of is there actually some uh, material down on the roadway as well. So there's a lot of information that's available in, in the road weather information systems. We always like to try tie it to an application like flash beacons ahead that the ice might be bridgy, uh, you know, might uh, come up ahead. So, you know, there's lots of things like that that we can showcase. <laughs> Bruce, <laughs> high mass lighting and control monitoring. This was a far more complicated one. I see you've got a big smile on your face. Um, this we did in, in Hoover, Hoover, Alabama, is we did high mass lighting control and monitoring. So when you look at there, there's the same FMU unit in the cabinet, but then it's monitoring a 380 volt source, I believe, uh, 488, 480 volts. Um, and then we were monitoring multiple different trunk currents going through there. When I clicked on it this morning, obviously the lights were off because mm -hmm. it was in the morning. Um, and they ran on a schedule, right? Yeah, uh, to get it working, we, I went ahead and just went through and kind of put in a daylight, tape, daylight savings time schedule from an almanac uh, for these devices, which is easily adjustable, uh, just like a school beacon schedule. Uh, to make sure that they were coming on kind of right before and, and going off before it got too bright. Okay. Um, and, and we also have some other products that we're going to be talking about in some of the other sessions that are designed for street lighting 
um, that we can actually monitor whether or not your street lights are working correctly and tell you if you any, have any faults. Um, there's another area that we do, which is dynamic message sign control. So we've done a number of these projects um, in Marietta where we do the trailer signs. Yeah, this is Alabama in the Southwest District uh, where they've actually got DMS signs that they're controlling for their um, ferry crossing. <clears throat> what did they, can you remember what type of signs they were using there that they were connecting to? Uh, I want to say they're Dactronics. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Was well, Dactronic signs? Um, so you know, we work with NTCIP signs, uh, and we're able to display the messages on there. Here, they were showing, um, you know, the the open or closed, and you can create any kind of message you want, like, you know, road work ahead. Um, and what we do is we even uh, bring up a, a what you see is what you get, a WYSIWYG is what they call it in the DMS sign business, and show you exactly how it's going to display on the sign. You can schedule messages to be displayed. You can create different, um, you know, different um, media libraries and things like that that you can showcase. Um, all right, we're back to Washington County. Drew, <laughs> another one of your projects. Yes, the uh, the snow beacons. Um, that was a really a really interesting one. So they're they're using the cameras uh, that we can connect through the Ethernet port to the the FMU device uh, to get a static picture of what the road conditions are like. Uh, they actually had this also hooked up to a BBS since it was on AC power. That way they they would know if they lost AC power, if the battery's keeping everything alive and working. Uh, but it was a good way to get you know, more information about what the roads are doing. So when uh, they flashed the it, the, why did they actually flash the beacons? Is it because there's going to be snow there? Is it no parking at that time? What is, why um, do they flash the beacons? It's because of snow and once again, the road conditions. Yeah. Okay. So it's a little cheaper than putting out the big Star Wars uh, solution, like in the curve warning. Uh, but it's still a real good remote system for monitoring your road conditions and being able to control what's going on. Okay, okay. Um, all right, I'm not going to do questions at the moment. I will uh, ask everybody if you've got any other questions, uh, just, just let me know. And I'm going to stop this, uh, this stream over here. And um, we're going to go and grab a mobile camera coming up now, where we're actually going to showcase, um, walk around here, show some of the actual technology running. Uh, so that you can see everything. So if you've got any questions, type them in. We'll do our best to answer all these questions. Give me two seconds as I grab the mobile camera and we walk around with... All right, Drews. All right. So first we're going to go to our, our railroad beacon. So wait, first of all, where are we? Where is everyone walking? We are at the IATL, which is uh, an infrastructure lab for automotive technology that uh, AI has partnered with a few other businesses to create. Uh, so you can see basically a sample of everything that we kind of do in technology in the road uh, traffic industry. And this is also for auto manufacturers that they can come test their cars that it can work with the connected vehicle messages. Right, so we have the things as basic and simple as like our school beacons, which is to say a lot to say basic and simple, and then all the way up to our new solutions, which deal more with just connected vehicles on the roadway. Uh, of course, you'll see plenty of traffic controllers, and uh, we actually have two cabinets, uh, a 332 and an EMA, uh, to do experiments and have it like a lab. All right, you want to take us through, I don't want to, t we do a lot of different sessions in the IATL, so um, you want to talk about railroad crossings first? Yes. Uh, for here, we have our railroad crossing. This is typically what would be going in the cabinet for where the blank out sign or the message sign would go. This is our standard uh, school beacon, an 070 device. Um, AC, of course, since we have our flasher. I'm just going to go ahead and turn this on. And we have lights right here that show. We have a cellular connection here. And then, of course, 
through our harness is where we'd come and enable either a blank out sign to give it power instantly, or we can do flashers as well. What do you mean by blank out sign? What, what is that and how would that look? The blank out signs are usually blank and uh, nothing is displayed when they're inactive. And then when we activate them, then there's some message that shows up. So it's kind of like they're, they're blanked out when they're not being used. But when they're active, you're getting a message accordingly. OK, now you've turned this unit on. What do we, where, where's the actual physical? You want to walk us up to that, sure. to that unit over there that's, that's now flashing. Right. And in our circumstance, we just went ahead and used normal, normal beacons. But here we have Front Street is in use, seek alternate route, when flashing. And right now, we have to go a different way because they are flashing. And, that, and that's just to save people time and money in terms of not sitting around there. Frustration, yeah. We, we want to make traffic flow easier and make everybody, because we all sit in traffic. It's one of those common denominators. So I, I know. And, you know, we've, I've had a lot of conversations with different cities that say, you know, the mayor, the one thing he always asks us is, how do we deal with this? Because I get all these damn calls that come in that, you know, citizens are complaining that they can't drive through this intersection. How can we solve it? And this, this same solution could also be used for a bridge opening and, and other types of yeah, applications. Yeah, any kind of drawbridge or anything where the road's going to be blocked for some kind of time. Okay, on the, on the, um, the left or the right of you over there, I see another sign saying road may flood, which was one of the other things that, that you were talking about. Can you explain what that technology is and, 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 and where it is and how it all works? Sure, so just quickly we'll come over here. We've got the road may flood sign and this is basically what we have up here is an ultrasonic sensor. And that sensor is actually determining if there's uh, a rise in something from the roadbed that might be flooding. It, it could be a freak snowstorm that dropped three feet of snow or something and that, that would cause a road to be almost flooded since snow is water. Um, and a lot of that happens, most of these are deployed in Texas where, you know, they have flooding under bridges there in the Houston area that obviously are, are pretty intense. Yes. Um, but this is a perfect example. The sensor's up high. It's hitting the road. If there's any kind of difference, they're very precise. So they're going to measure just even the, a half inch or quarter inch of water down there. And that sensor basically sits on a mast arm hanging over the roadway. Right, and once again, we also have a camera so you can get that, that video, that visual inspection as well. When it does hit the alarm state, it'll send you the video to show you that, hey, there is something in the street. All right, what actually goes in the cabinet then with a, uh, is, is it the same multi-purpose device that you talk about it all the time? It is my favorite Swiss Army knife that we have. Here we have our 050, the FMU. And we can see it has a heartbeat and central light like all our devices. We don't have a camera hooked up to this one, in, but this is where it would normally go, an IP camera. We have our power supply. This is the power supply usually for the camera. It just provides 12 volts because we, we run 24 volts here. We have a relay, and that's what's going to flip on the flasher. And then we have our output, which goes to this is the control unit actually for the sensor. The ultrasonic sensor. The ultrasonic sensor, yes. Okay, so this is basically providing a whole bunch of information uh, from from that uh, sensor, and it comes in a four to twenty milliamp signal, and we just basically measure that. Yes, uh, you know the four to twenty milliamp is an industrial standard. Uh, we can also do fun things like zero to five volts as well. Um, I think on the laser, we're literally just taking an input from the, the COM port. So how would it have worked uh, with the, um, uh, the, other, the other sensor that you did in Oregon? Is it, is it, is it just exactly the same kind of signal? The, the, yeah, it the, was a 4 to 20 milliamp as well. Okay, so that seems That's to be... That's why I said that's an industrial standard. Uh, this is the ultrasonic one. They have a radar. Anderson Hauser makes a radar sensor that also puts out the 4 to 20 milliamp because that's so common. Uh, the 0 to 5 volts is not as common, but it's just as easy to, to use. Okay, now I'm also seeing the, the cabinets here on the left that you were talking about earlier. Can you show us the unit that goes inside of the cabinet? Yeah, this is uh, the unit we call it. It's the FMU2. It's the second version of the FMU. Uh, this is more of what we call for the intersection cabinet. 
uh, since it has more of the input specified for your preemption and green sense and figuring out what's going on in your cabinet, AC, all that kind of um, stats. But this is what would take your, your preempt signal or your other input signal from the railroad system to send the message to the beacon, the railroad beacon, to know that it should turn on the lights. Okay, and then we've also got a um, some some cameras over here, and you were talking about some of the cameras that actually had the ability of detecting a, a, a railroad ca yes. car. This was a good example of the camera, uh, and once again, as we were talking about ultrasonic or even a radar sensor would be able to determine that there's something now on the tracks. We could even use the laser. <laughs> Laser's a little tricky because you got to make sure the train is definitely in the way of the laser because there are gaps, but yeah. Awesome, awesome. Okay, um, I know I've seen a couple of questions that have popped up, but we'll go sit down and answer these questions. I first want you to just go and show everyone what these uh, lasers look like and some of the other equipment that you've brought in with you. All right. Here is the laser unit we were using. Uh, easily mountable, of course, on a Pelco mount. I'm just going to come in a little closer yeah. over here so everybody can see the, the back side of the laser over there from Laser Tech. So this is another one of those things that we utilize this uh, great technology that other companies have made and integrate it into our systems. And those are the two laser beams uh, coming out the front. Right. And can you show us the, um, the oh, what, what else have you got here toy-wise? We don't actually have a, uh, a Starwis or Marwis. We have what's called the NERS, which is kind of the predecessor of the Starwis. But this is basically your big mounted ra road sensor. So it'd be mounted much higher up than I'm standing. Um, and pointing down at the road surface to collect all the data using a number of sensors that it has to determine the road conditions. Okay, okay, perfect. Well, what we're going to do, guys, is we're going to walk back uh, and go and sit down at our um, at our at our desks over there, and then um, I see there's a bunch of questions and things like that that we'll try and answer and um, see if we can get back into that. All right, I, I think we're on the live cameras over here again. And um, Jessica, why don't you come at us with uh, a couple of these questions that we can see if we can uh, answer that, that everybody's been asking. Yeah, we have quite a So the first one is a general question about Glance. How do we re acquire it? Is it included with the system costs or is there an additional annual subscription? Um, uh, I'll let you answer that one and then uh, follow up with the next one. So the question was, uh, is Glance an annual subscription cost or is there a... Yeah. Okay. So, so the way that all of our devices work is we actually have a... Um, the piece of hardware that you saw, the, the FMU unit or the school beacon that comes in. And then what we do is we provide a... Um, connectivity and support plan that comes with it. So the Glance license is actually perpetual. Uh, you have that forever, and there is a connectivity and support plan that goes with it. Most people do about five years for the connectivity and support plan, and that gives you five years of connectivity, five years of free upgrades of software, security upgrades. It also gives you um, a five-year warranty on your hardware as well. So for that whole period of time, you've got an extended warranty, you just ship it back to us and we replace the unit if there's any kind of failures. Um, a lot of people in, in Texas uh, and a number of other places do 10 years as well. So you know, it just depends on, on what the budgets are because then they get a 10-year warranty on the hardware, which is kind of unheard of. And also that feeding, we all know radio technology We've gone from 2G to 3G to 4G. We're going to 5G. There's going to be 6G. And just over the last five years, we've gone from 2G, 3G to 4G. Now, I guess we're going to be changing technologies, 
So let's plan for uh, getting an upgrade. So what we do is part of that connectivity and service plan is we actually will upgrade the cellular technology as part of it. Back over to you, Jessica. Um, do you, we talked about a cellular connection. Someone is asking, do you offer a fiber connected system? Great question. So absolutely. So, you know, when we're doing, and, and we have a lot of this more often in traffic signal cabinets. So when you've got a traffic signal cabinet, you often have fiber there. When you've got a solar device or whatever, generally you don't have fiber. So most people are using that. So we have the option to communicate over your fiber network or over, your, or over our cellular network or both. So what we do is we see is there communication over the ethernet and if there isn't over, over the cellular. So there's multiple different ways of us doing it and then what we do is We've got this connectivity and support plan. So it becomes not a connectivity and support plan, but just a support plan if you're just gonna use your own fiber. So there's a great way of um, us providing um, that information, those different options, because if a city's invested in, in their fiber network, there's no point in putting the cellular out there. So go ahead, we'll use your, we'll use your fiber network um, at, at those locations. Awesome. Um, is there a max speed of detection capable with the over the height detection system? Ooh, that sounds like a difficult question. And I'm not sure if Truce knows that. Uh, maximum speed, I believe with those lasers, because don't forget those are the same lasers the, um, the police department's using in their handhold guns. I think the max speed is pretty damn fast. Um, what we did was we configured it for basically kind of like a, a two by four going at a certain speed. Uh, that's not going to damage the bridge. So there, it, it's, once again, it's technology. It's fine tunable based on, on the scenario. So we did something that we knew it would, it could hit it fine, but a two by four hitting a train bridge isn't going to do any kind of damage. It Good needs point. to be a lot. So, it needed to be something a lot larger at at a certain speed, and of course, you can do the math to figure out uh, if it's moving this fast. Then your detection is only going to be this this small or this large again. Uh, so it's customizable. That's hmm. a, that's the long and the short of it. Okay. Okay. So it's, so basically, that that sensor is um, you. There's obviously a whole bunch of different configuration yeah. settings, and when you're doing the drive testing, you're going to do fine tuning and part of the project is what is it that you want to see you know hit the bridge and you guys said okay anything under a size of a so if it's just an aerial of a car that's yeah, going to hit antenna. it you don't care right but if it's a two by four size shape of something that's when you trigger yeah okay i'm learning new things as well guys me too okay does Glance offer streaming from the cameras and does it provide images or video of the event? Great question. Um, Glance does provide the ability of doing streaming video. So we can stream video from like up to four different cameras. So we can actually stream, uh, you know, a lot of the times it's detection cameras at traffic signals, we can stream those. We do PTZ cameras. We're doing the full pan tilt zoom. Um, on some of these, obviously when you're doing streaming video, it takes a lot more data and you need a more beefed up device from us. So like that FMU unit that we use um, is designed to take pictures, send pictures back, but it wasn't designed to do the streaming video. If you want to do streaming video, we've got something that's a high speed modem unit that we put in, which is, it's actually the same size, it's just, it, it's a bit more expensive because the hardware is a bit more capable. And obviously the connectivity and support plan when you're doing streaming video is more expensive than just taking snapshot pictures. When there's an event, we track the picture as well, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Drews, we track the picture as well as the information that comes back at the same time. Yes, that is correct. We, we take a, 
Uh, and for a lot of the sensors, we have a built-in percentage of changes. Uh, normally, the device is posting back to glance every half hour when everything's normal, everything's working. But say there is a flash flood, and then you know it just posted, and then five minutes later, flash flood raises the level. That change will actually kick off to give you a new picture and new data. And then in another five minutes, if it keeps rising, or even three minutes, it will post again with an image and that new data. So, so, there's, so to answer the question, there's two different types. We do just the pictures itself, or we can do um, streaming video with pictures. So it'll do both. Uh, and it's just a case of what your application is and what, you, what you're trying to achieve. Great. Um, someone's asking, have you ever been involved in any projects involving variable speed limits, VSL? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, okay, so there's, there's, uh, we've been involved with variable speed limits with a company called SES America. They do variable speed limits. It's like that sign back there that says your speed. Um, and their, their project had you know, multiple variable speed limits um, that they were displaying basically two digits on this sign and two digits on that sign. And what we do is we've got NTCIP controllers. So our device actually does full NTCIP communication, can communicate back to an NTCIP central, or it can communicate back to Glance where you can actually set your speed limits. Now, interestingly enough, those signs back there from Traffic Calm and Carmana actually have a variable speed limit option mode or whatever in them that we can also do it. Now, that's not a, a NTCIP sign. Some of these projects require NTCIP. We're federally funded. Um, but for the projects where you're trying to set up a variable speed limit, and you're not worried about it, Comana, Traffic Calm, uh, provide a great solution for doing that. The main difference, generally speaking, with variable speed limits is you make the digits, um, the digits actually become, I think the latest standard is, and don't quote me on this, the latest standard is actually you blank out the digits and your, all your LEDs turn on, so it shows you 8-8, eight, eight, like you would see on the highway with a, with a, um, um, you know, if the speed limit's 65, it'll say 65, but the actual digits are black and all the LEDs around it are lit. So that's actually how they do it in the variable speed limit uh, sign. Um, so it's just a different operation of those kinds of signs for the, for the variable speed limits, not the, uh, for the, sorry, speed feedback signs do just the speed feedback and the variable speed limits are doing the, those uh, white LEDs with black digits. Awesome. And last question here. Someone asked, uh, this was previously when you guys were over by the wall, and um, they said, are you using incandescent light or DEL? Del? Um, I think you said it in the LEDs. Uh, so we do both. Um, depend, most of these are LEDs behind us. Um, but we have a lot of, you know, and that actually comes from the, the school beacon side. Um, we can do both incandescent and LEDs. Uh, most people, if anything, solar, I've never seen it. It's always an LED light with solar. But with the AC, sometimes you still have some of the incandescent bulbs. Um, and what's great with that is our technology can actually monitor whether or not a LED has failed. So we monitor the current through the actual LEDs and we can actually tell you that LED, you've had one LED fail or one incandescent bulb fail or two so that you know to go send your technician out there that he's gonna go and bring some spare bulbs or new LEDs that he can go and replace them. So there's a lot of this kind of technology that we've built into our school zones, we've built into our emergency vehicles. And, and the great thing is all of the code that we've created for all these different types of applications is available on all of our different platforms. So when Drus is doing a snow beacon control project, 
he, he starts off with information from his, um, what do you want to call it, his, uh, you know, project that he did, um, you know, road weather information system, and then activates it, you know, using the same kind of cameras. So we've done lots of uh, custom projects. We're doing one in, in um, a road weather information system in Oregon County where uh, they're using multiple different uh, weather sensors at the same time to get more information back. So there's a lot of, you know, these kind of customized projects that we do. It's not our core core business, which is obviously school beacons, emergency vehicles getting green lights, and um, intersection communication. But what we try to do is we build up a whole city of, of things, uh, you know, of equipment that you've got one platform then that you can monitor all of your different devices. And we bring all of that back into our connected vehicle message set. So like the DMS message signs, when you're driving through Marietta, we'll come back and say, um, Chalktoberfest is happening this weekend, you know, at Marietta Square. And it'll announce it to the people driving through the city. So we try to basically build everything and build a whole platform around all of this technology. Yeah, and a perfect example is the, the railroad beacons. You know, before you'd have to get close enough to see the sign to say, hey, the train is there. But now, like through the Travel Safely app, you'll be told before you get close enough, before you might get stuck in everybody else that didn't pay attention, and be able to avoid that traffic. Awesome. Any more questions right, there? there? Yes, I know I said that was the last one, but we have some additional ones. Um, somebody is asking if we have any Canadian projects. Uh, yes, so we've got a number of different deployments. Uh, we work with um, some of the school zone providers uh, like Carmana, uh, who are very active in Canada, and they've got our equipment deployed in a number of different places, uh, some in on Ontario, and then we've also got uh, a very big deployment in Quebec City, where we're doing every single one of their emergency vehicles um, controlling, uh, you know, doing the preemption for 480 or 440 signals and roughly 70, 80 vehicles. Um, and there's a couple of other things that we've got deployed in, in the Quebec area with our partner up there who is uh, Orange Traffic. Awesome. Someone asking, um, how the laser sensor works again for the overheight vehicle detection but i know that we're also running out of time so we can also do a one-on-one -on -one follow-up if you would rather do that yeah so it's using a it's using a laser beam in exactly the same way that that the uh police department is using uh lasers on on their side uh or, to actually... or if you want to think about all your classic spy movies someone's walking through and they trip the beam um, the difference is, is we, can, we can specify where they can walk and where they can't walk, uh, which part of the beam we actually care about tripping, and then we send a signal. Uh, in one circumstance, the flashers are far enough away, we're actually using uh, 900 hertz radio to get to the flashers to tell them to activate and let them know that they are too high. That's a much better explanation than what I gave. <laughs> <laughs> we're using freaking lasers. <laughs> Uh, brilliant. Uh, I know I've only got about six minutes, so what I'm going to do is quickly um, change my screen to show you um, the what Glance looks like, um, just to give you guys a bit of an idea uh, in terms of, you know, um, what what the user interface looks like. So we've got, you know, over here we've got um, this is Washington County. And you can see it's all Google Map-based interface, meaning you can zoom in and you can see these different uh, devices over here. That was the water, um, the water uh, height detection. And you can see it looks like it's raining right now in, um, in Washington County. And I can click more details, and I'll actually get more details about this device. I can click on the camera image, and you can see, yeah, the lens is a bit wet there. They're the gates that they have, there's the water back there. So there's a, you know, a lot of information that you can see over there. 
and we can go um, zoom out over here. You can also, you can see they've got school zones that are getting controlled over here and there are all their snow beacons that they've got deployed. There's one of their weather stations for the curve warning. Um, so it's a, what's really cool with this is, and I don't see any errors at the moment, but if there was a, a failure on any one of these devices, you would actually get a big red ring around a unit that will actually tell you that there's a failure. And at the same time, you get a text message, email message of any kind of failure, if you had a power failure or so it's. So there's you know, a lot of information that's available here. And it's just a very easy to use. It works on your smartphone as well. Right now, I'm using an iPad to open it up. But it's real easy to um, you know, see what's happening and go into more details of every single device over here. You know, this is the curve warning um, radar sign that we can see all that kind of information back from it. And um, we can also go into, you know, a snow beacon device. And you can click on just straight away on the picture as well. And you can see, you know, that's the picture that was taken, um, you know, of that um, radar sign over there. I mean, a, a snow beacon. So there's a lot of different information that's available via all of these different types of um, systems. And DMS signs, blank out message signs, you know, we've got ferry crossing signs that we've activated in Clackamas County that below here. So there's hundreds of different types of applications. And the cool thing is every single device looks different on the map. You can see what's a snow beacon, what's a school zone, and what a flood warning device is. So all of that information is very easy to see straight away. And it's Google Maps, so it works in the same way that you used to using everything. Um, I know I've only got about two minutes left. So Jessica, were, were there any other questions that were prompted? Um, otherwise, yeah, I, we have okay. one last one. Um, can Glance be integrated with agency's ATMS software, or does it run separately at the TMC? Great question. So uh, in Alabama Southwest, uh, Southwest District, we have an API where they actually integrated to their um, system there that they were controlling for their tunnel control platform. And in Harris County, um, they've actually integrated our school zones and some of our warnings for our um, intersections into their Centrax system. So they've got a Centrax system that's running everything. So we have an open free API that allows anyone to get the data and integrate Glance into another platform. So if you guys have got a different platform over there, obviously we've got to talk to whoever's providing your current system, but you can bring all the school zone information, all of the overheight, flood warning, any of our devices into um, your third party platform. We've got to talk to the supplier of that, you know, explain how our API works. And then they basically um, ingest that information and build it into their platform as well. Great. That was the last one. Awesome. Awesome. I'm uh, right on time this week. I haven't gone over. so, <laughs> And I think I basically went over most of our stuff. I will say if anyone's got any questions, please reach out to me, Jessica, Drews, and uh, we'll follow up with a one-on-one -on -one call where we can basically take you in more depth through the technology. Obviously, we've rushed through multiple different things today. So any interest that you guys have, just follow up with us. We'll connect up with you and... Um, set up something personal. So I want to thank everyone for joining us and um, until our next session.